Android. Um, hopefully this will be quite an interesting uh, story. So whilst we currently work for NHS uh, South Yorkshire, which was formed about a year ago, and is helping build integrated care pathways uh, across South Yorkshire uh, as one of 42 um, ICBs across the country. We're actually going to report on an experiences at NHS Digital, as was, and I think you've had a speaker here previously from NHS yep. Digital. Um, but just a bit about me currently, so I'm Chief Digital Information Officer, so I've got quite a broad portfolio covering digital transformation, uh, IT operations, you know, security, uh, uh, data and insights teams as well. So data is quite at the forefront of trying to drive improvement and change across, across NHS driving decision making. Um, so it's, it's quite an integral thing and that's why we kind of brought this topic up today uh, to talk about how we can use Agile to bear and uh, bring, bring those tools and capabilities to bear on, on analytical uh, services and analytical requirements. Rachel, do you want to introduce yourself now or do you want to do that later on? Okay. So, as I said, it's a bit of a story, but the first thing you're probably thinking is, a lot of people think this, well, Agile's for software development, so why are you here? You talk about data, right? But I think, the way we see it is that, and I'm sure you guys agree, it's a mindset, it's a way of solving problems, taking what are massive slugs of work, breaking them down to deliverable chunks, prioritizing them, but most importantly, focusing on the users and that delivery, making sure we're adding value uh, as much as you possibly can and as early as you possibly can in the life cycle of the product. So what I wanna do is share a bit of an example of, of how we brought that mindset to bear on, on analytical challenges a couple of years or, or, or so ago. So just for a bit of context, back in 2020, I'm sure you'll all remember it, there was a bit of a pandemic called COVID-19, largely forgotten about now, we don't really worry about it too much. Obviously that was probably one of the biggest pandemics that we've ever faced. Um, at that point in time, there was a big change. National data sets that were historically used for statistics to inform ministers on how NHS services were, were performing, um, used for research, actually now were being used to drive care. And there's some examples on here, so shield a patient list. I'm sure you'll all remember the day when Boris got on the TV and said, people must stay at home. And then there was a further announcement that the most vulnerable in our society definitely must stay at home. And there was a list of conditions associated with that. We used national data sets, linked national data sets, to identify those people. And I think it was about 900,000 people on the initial shield of patient list. A lot of late nights, a lot of SQL coding, quite not as complicated as, as the previous presentation, but um, nevertheless, we linked a lot of data sets together and we used that to identify the most vulnerable in our society. And then that continued and grew and ended up being about 3.7 million people on that, on that vulnerable list. Data were then being used to expand that. So rather than just linking simple data sets, we're then looking at risk stratification to identify further populations of people who might be vulnerable based on other risk factors. Then we were saying, well, there's treatments coming out now. How do we identify and prioritize people for treatment? So there's a lovely new therapeutic what, what clinical criteria do we need? And what people do we need to identify who can qualify for that? Then there's people who have nominated themselves for vaccine trials when the vaccines start to then come along. We need to identify those people. We need to log them. We need to write reports and dashboards and analysis, again, up to ministers, out to the system, out to the public to let people know what was happening. So all this brought a challenge Increasing demand for analytical insights to support, as I said, the design, provision, evaluation, and research related to COVID-19. There's a real need to learn from the key programs that popped up really quickly, like the Shield of Patient List. I think it took about eight days overall from getting the request down to, you need to identify the most vulnerable in our society, to then release value. So think about that, eight days we never moved that quickly previously in the NHS, but we had to, we had no choice. And I think that was start of the mind sh mindset shift, particularly in the, in the data space. But also focusing on the users. What do the, the clinicians need? What do the, the public need? What do the ministers need to make really good decisions about the future um, of, of our country and relative to this, this pandemic? So what we needed to do 
was to create a really responsive analytical service. So we felt the key to that was, as I said, that user-centered approach, being really flexible and not having a process that, that is a blocker, actually taking a step back and saying, information governance, if you ever work in the data space, information governance is always the trickiest thing. Oh, you can't use that data for that purpose. That's not what it was collected for. Oh, well, that's, that's not allowed. Sorry, I can't do that. Actually, it's taking a step back and saying, well, what's practicable, what's pragmatic, and what does the user need? As I said, that clear mindset and focus on delivery, not thinking, oh, well, we need to put a waterfall plan together for this, because as I said, we deliver the shield of patient list in a couple of weeks-ish. Had we actually sat back and said, oh, I need to build a waterfall plan, it'd probably taken us two weeks to do that, and we wouldn't have even got anywhere, no value, no delivery. So we needed to change our mindsets and focus on that delivery. But also we need to, to worry about governance. Really important when what you do directly affects people. We also need to be flexible, as I said. Lots of priorities, I mentioned some of the programs uh, earlier. We need to be able to pivot quickly. So we need to prioritize on a very, very moving landscape. So I'm just gonna put the, the manifesto up on here. So again, very much this is obviously this, this was born related to you know that quick value driven um, software development that you know, no nonsense software delivery question will it will this mindset work in analytics will it approach when what we do affects patients so it says here working software of a comprehensive documentation but when what we do affects patients documentation and governance is really key so it's about building a process that gets that right, but doesn't hinder that delivery, that fast-paced um, reaction to user requirements. And also, the NHS is a big machine. There's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of things going on. So how does a very empowered, agile delivery team operate within that broader landscape when we need to follow a process? Which again, going back to the first one, focus on individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We have to follow processes to make sure that we're doing things correctly. Luckily, NHS Digital, as was, um, obviously it's now been merged into to NHS England. They were actually quite progressive in this space. A lot of their data teams, uh, a lot of their software development teams, live services teams operated using um, agile delivery methodologies anyway, but it had not really been done in the data space before. However, they were quite progressive in the data services directorate. They did a lot of discovery to try and work out. This was before COVID, by the way, back in 2019, to, to take that more product focused approach and look at, well, how can we use delivery management, scrum masters, Kanban boards, scrum boards, all those sorts of things. How can we test all those tools to see if they fit in that analytical environment? And they did actually set up a model office to test these tools and to work through them. Also did a lot of research, you know, but these are software houses, Spotify, Microsoft, still very much software driven organizations. We even visited other government organizations to see how they operated in terms of their agile tools and techniques. But again, that was about running, maintaining live digital products, not about data. But nevertheless, there was some key learnings in there that we could, that we could take. So the ultimate aim then, what we had to do in the middle of this pandemic, when everybody was rushed off the feet, I think I peaked at one point at 85 hours for the working week. Um, safe to say my office at home stunk like a teenager's bedroom, never left there, pile of pots everywhere, wife wasn't happy, so there you go. Um, COVID gave us the push we needed to try and think about how we can do things differently. And out of the back of all these analytical requirements, we were tasked with building an analytical insights service inside NHS Digital to support delivery of insight out to all the arm's length bodies like NHS England, like the Department of Health, like um, you know, other uh, care systems like ministers um, and so on. As I said, we needed a big focus on co-creation. We needed to get that mindset right across everybody. The best way to do that, empower your people. People are the most important. So we wanted to build that culture, we wanted to get that empowered team with that really delivery focus, can do attitude. But, Going back to what I said earlier, we needed to make sure we were aligned. Aligned to what was going on around us in terms of other moving parts within the directorate, within the organization, national organizations, 
the wider NHS system and, and health and care. So what were the building blocks to this? So what I'm going to try and do is focus less on the uh, tools, that will come a bit later, but just focus on the hearts and minds piece around how we change that, that mindset from a, well, this is how we've always done analytics in a waterfall way, actually to a more delivery focused, user centered mindset, taking on that, that manifesto and learnings from software development. As I said, the first bit for us was to really build that culture and mindset. So we set to having some co-creation sessions with each of our uh, team members and our, our broader teams to build that culture. We worked together to identify and co-create what our purpose was. So why are we here? Why do we come to work every single day? What are the principles that underpin the delivery of this purpose that we should hold ourselves to account against on a day-to-day -day basis? What are the methods that we need to employ? Going back to the things I mentioned, good governance, being clear about accountability and responsibility, which comes through empowerment, getting the leadership right to make sure that we had that empowerment, but also that upward alignment. Identifying who our key customers were, because we needed a focus on our customers. That's what it's all about, right? Delivering value as early as possible to those that need it. And then how do we do that from a tools perspective? Lots of moving parts in there, like the data sets that we access on AWS uh, through Databricks and how we do our documentation and, and so on. So we wanted to instill that agile mindset in our ways of working um, by self-organizing the team. The next bit was the actual team architecture itself. So once we created that, that sense of purpose in that team charter, we then set to looking at the architecture within our actual team. We really wanted these empowered squads of individuals that could go and work directly with customers, get that to and fro, that, that real side-by-side -side work, in particular with the clinicians who were incredibly important, um, helping them uh, decode some of the national guidance and turn it into um, technical logic to identify people in our data sets, really key. So I wanted to make sure we had empowered squads that could go and do that work in, in true agile fashion. But as I said, we needed strategic oversight to make sure that we were feeding seniors and making sure we were aligning ourselves to, uh, to the organization that was, that was wrapped around us. But we needed to surface data and insights faster. So I talked about building clear lines of responsibility, again, through empowerment. So this is starting to touch a little bit on the actual process. So we've, to recap, we've, built, we've got the culture right. We've agreed what our purpose is. We agree how we're going to work together as a team and why we're here on a day-to-day basis, why we get out of bed. We've worked through what our architecture looks like from our squad structures and how they link together. Now we're going to start to put around the business processes that wrap around that. First of which is clear lines of responsibility to create that empowerment. So we had to have, because of the volume of work, we had to have a process through which we would triage our all of our requests. So in, in Agile, you get a product, project, a product manager who works on, on behalf of the team and prioritizes that backlog and helps and owns the roadmap really for that particular product. We had products all over the place, analytical products, lots of different customers. We needed a way to arrest that and create a steady sequence stream of work into the squads that's happening. I think we had about five squads um, of, of staff. We need to prioritize that so that everybody was clear that the prioritization on, on the squad work was actually in and amongst this broader, broader context. But we didn't want to do that in isolation. We wanted to empower the team to review that. So then we had a, a roadmap meeting, which is essentially a scrum of scrums, right? So we brought all the squad leaders together and we said, right, there's new work coming in. Let's talk about the requirements. Let's identify the risks, issues and blockers. So that's the good governance bit. So straight away, inherently within this structure, we're already starting to bubble up the challenges that we might face. But also, we're starting to knowledge share at the same time. Then after that, the work drops down into the squads for sprint planning, elaboration, stand-ups, and delivery. What I will say, though, is it looks quite hierarchical. The NHS, by definition, is hierarchical. We're all bound to the agenda for change, pay scales, and and in that is hierarchy. But what we tried to promote as part of our culture was that flat structure. Everybody is equal and everybody is equally important. So everybody has a voice across the entire team. That's really important to make sure that everybody feels empowered and they feel supported when they come to work. 
Wrapping around those layers of uh, responsibility then comes the communication framework. So again, we talked about the senior leadership team taking care of the strategic prioritization, not the in-flight product related prioritization, the strategic prioritization. Scrum of scrums, roadmap and review that looked at the entire request backlog and then you had your individual squads doing their own elaboration on their own backlogs, the sprint plans, uh, using the JIRA balls for the, for the daily stand-ups. But this comms framework allowed us to make sure we had that overview coming up from the squads into that roadmap and review, which then got passed upwards to the leadership team, which meant we could then go and speak to senior colleagues in the organisation, explain very clearly what our backlog of work looks like, what our prioritised delivery plan looks like, and overall, what our feature release roadmap for our entire set of squads look like to create that aligned autonomy. So the squads were fully autonomous, working as individual units, they self-organised. We didn't tell them how to do their stand-ups. We didn't tell them how to do their um, you know, requirements, elaborations or anything. They did that themselves. They fully self-organised in, in true agile fashion. All we did was bolt on these extra couple of bits to make sure we had the good governance flowing up and around the organisation. Over to you, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kieran. Um, hi, everyone. Um, Rachel Carrington. Current job title is Head of Portfolio and Operations, which is just a fancy way of saying I work for Kieran uh, at South Yorkshire. And we have worked together before at NHSD. And I would say that he is the visionary, he's the ideas man, and he employs people like me to do the do. Um, so when it came to the COVID pandemic and Kieran had an awful lot on his plate, um, we were there to sort of look at the operations of the team in an agile way as he's described. So in terms of actually putting this in place, we had access at NHSD to JIRA and Confluence. So that was the path of least resistance to get us set up. Um, we've already talked about a clearly prioritised backlog of work, um, worked in analytical sprint cycles. So a lot of this terminology was really new to our people. So there's something about managing change here. And in terms of culture and dealing with people, I think that it was quite a big jump quite quickly. So one of the learnings to take away in terms of that is to over communicate with people and to let them have a go, give them access to the tools, let them play around. Inevitably, in any team, you've got at least a couple of people that are really keen and excited to learn about new things and to play around and to really lead uh, what, what the tool is capable of doing in that scenario. Um, scrum stand-ups in delivery documentation. So documentation is really key here. And again, that was a change in culture and a change in mindset to do documentation in a different way. Um, service level feature release roadmaps. So by capturing all the information in a single tool like JIRA, for the first time, we had really good management information in one place. Um, so we'll come on to that and give you some examples. So um, the structure that we used was to have um, a Kanban board as the overarching triage board. So all new work requests would come in and be discussed at that senior leadership team level. It's just an example there. As part of the meeting at senior leaders every Tuesday, um, there was a triage process. So they defined the scoring mechanism, what criteria was important for these pieces of work. You know, was it coming from number 10? <laughs> was it coming from Kieran? Um, that type of thing we were looking at. How important, how urgent, how quickly does it need to be turned around? Is it this JFDI or is it we've got two weeks to deliver? So we turned that into a prioritization, which then populated the tickets. So again, capturing all the information that you need. And because of the pure volume and pace at which we were working, the benefit of having everything in JIRA here is everyone's got access to everything. There's nothing being done behind closed doors. It's all transparent. If you needed help with something, you could just go in and search. Somebody else is already working on this piece of work or has got experience of that. They did it last week. It's all there and easily accessible by everyone. So we had a, a schedule. So this was a really different way of working. So we had five squads, all of data analysts. And historically, they'd be in a position of, I've got experience of primary care data, and that's what I like to focus on. Over in another team, you'll have, I've got experience of medication data, and that's what I focus on. 
So the benefit of having these five different squads all coming together and sharing knowledge and having the same schedule reaped so many benefits. So senior leadership team would meet on Tuesday morning, triage new work. The managers of each of the squads would pick that up Tuesday afternoon, review it Wednesday, meet on Thursday to talk about it with their peers. Have you had this before? How did you manage it? What can we learn off each other? <coughs> Excuse me. And then Thursday afternoon, the teams individually would meet, sprint planning and elaboration, all ready for the sprint to start on the following Tuesday. So obviously all the sprints are aligned. Everyone's on the same page. So sprint planning, we asked the squads to plan in detail basically the next month's worth of work. So we were clear on what we were all working on and loosely plan the third to six sprints after that, just to give us that security of what we've got on, but also the flexibility. So just a, a live sprint board, which I'm sure you are all overly familiar with. So one of the challenges that Kieran still has to manage is stakeholders and explaining to our chief statistician what we've got on, what we're working on as a priority. Um, and this was just a fabulous way of being able to do that without any additional manpower. So historically, you might have someone in a team, a PMO or an admin function who would run around pulling information together. Well, we didn't have to wait. We had this live any minute of any day to be able to answer questions that might be coming down. Did it work? <laughs> so the outcome at NHSD, we record the work that we do that's transparent, helps us to visualize, plan, track, deduplicate. So when you find out that five different squads are doing the same activity, all in isolation, you've got a massive opportunity there to do it once for all five. Uh, manage our workload, track the amount of work asked of us as a team to assist with stakeholder management. I think people were surprised at the volume that we actually produced. Part of that is to do with the cadence of working in sprints and being really focused. That was something new, being proactive rather than reactive. Work, you know, we were on the front foot, we'd got a backlog, being proactive with the work. Better manage our capacity and spread the load across us more evenly. What this gave us was the clear visual of what type of work each squad was doing and if it was fairly and evenly spread, who was doing all the quick stuff and was totally wiped out and stressed all the time and who got the stuff that took longer and was more relaxed. Uh, understand the types of requests and plan for the future. Prioritise more effectively. Provide an evidence base when managing expectations. So you could take information and cuts out of JIRA and go and meet with your customer and say, you know, you've asked us to do this type of work in the last week. Some of this was quite short deadline. Can we work together so you can give us more time next time? Can we plan this? Prepare for and schedule in known spikes throughout the year. An opportunity to support us to build learning and development into our daily life, building business continuity. So we had a risk. There were only certain people that knew certain data sets. By changing to this model, everyone was picking up new things and getting involved in things that maybe they'd heard about before but didn't have the opportunity. And that's really motivational for people. So thanks. I think so again, so just going back to this point of lots of work coming in, we needed to arrest that flow. You know, there were certain staff and certain teams that were pinched and pressured. We needed to load balance that across each of the teams. So we needed a really well-empowered autonomous model that was aligned to broader strategy and broader requirements. What we were able to do then was provide key support to a variety of different national programs directly to ministers in, in, some, in some instances. And like, like Rachel mentioned, we were able to load balance by, for example, one team that, that worked on medicines data, for example, uh, a new request came in to identify all the vulnerable people who needed a flu jab in the coming winter. So we were able to say, well, actually, it re might be really good. There's about six months leading for this piece of work. We'll schedule it in. It's a really good thing for you to pick up because it'll build that resilience and that skill in another area, area of the business. I think one of the things that we, we did really, really well was creating that space where each, each squad, basically, as you would expect, had its own... Um, product owner. So the products that got filtered into that squad, that product owner then was responsible for, 
for, for meeting with the customers, elaborating those requirements and really building that and building that into their, into their sprint plan. So by having the SLT triage process above didn't take away the requirement of the really good conversations that the product owner would have for that squad. All we were doing was ensuring that there was a sequencing and alignment, a strategic alignment to the work that each of the squads uh, were doing. It gave them the space to go and have the conversation with really key stakeholders like clinicians. Often during this period, there was a quite a long list of diagnosis codes that we had to sit and sift through with clinicians to ensure we were identifying the right people. We needed to do that to ensure that what we did was fit for purpose, but also to better understand the requirement from them. And as was mentioned, we built massive resilience through the federation of that workload for that load balancing. Lessons learned then, nothing's ever perfect, is it? We're taking um, a mindset and a, and a framework that was designed for run, maintain and transform of digital products, porting some of the key capabilities and the key tools, techniques, thought processes um, into a brand new environment. But as always, the process should not replace the conversations. We needed a process to ensure we were aligning ourselves effectively and the team was empowered and the team also wasn't doing 80 hours a week but the process shouldn't, should never replace the conversations. One of the things that we, we set off on the journey really early was co-creation. Really, really important, getting everybody in the room and getting everybody's buy-in, having that cross-section. And we, we repeated it numerous times, everybody has a voice, please speak up if you've got ideas. Really, really important to empower your teams. And then what the, as, as Rachel mentioned, having all of, our, all of our tickets, all of our epics in one place for each squad, I know this is child's play for a lot of software dev teams, but never been done before in analytics. Having everything all in one place meant that we had that transparent oversight of everything. It meant that we could use that to inform senior stakeholder conversations internally. We could use it to broker conversations with senior, with, with customers. So the product owner could take the overarching roadmap and say, look, you've asked for all this stuff here. You've asked for five things in the last five days. What's your priority? So it helped inform that. And you could take this, the, the service roadmap, the feature release roadmap and say, well, actually, if we look three months, we've roughly got a spot here. Would it, would it help if I take that and schedule it for here instead? We'll deprioritize it for now. Just really helped that conversation, having that objective evidence-based view in order to have that conversation. Um, I'm a big believer that if, you, if you're really open with people um, and you're honest, actually, you, you come to better arrangements rather than saying, oh, no. I need to take that through elaboration, then I'll speak to my product manager, and then I'll come back to you when I've done sprint planning three weeks past down the line, and you've still not told them a date when you're getting it delivered. In COVID, we needed to deliver, and we needed to deliver quickly. So this really helped, helped that. And that's it. All it leaves me to say is thank you for, for listening, and we need to obviously thank all the people involved in Analytical Insights Service, and, and, and it's just digital as well, as, and all those people that supported us in, in going down this, down this road but also all the people that worked really hard during COVID to protect the most vulnerable uh, in our society. It was that tremendous work that hopefully saved a lot of people. So that's it.